All right, well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure, let me start extending my deep gratitude to the city of Brasov, to the authorities of the city, and particularly to the citizens. Uh, you have a tremendously beautiful city. Uh, you should be very proud of it. So thanks for making the city shining green in the climate and energy space. Today, I want to talk about a topic that I truly believe would be a subject of fascination by this great play writer, writer uh, Eugene Ionescu, which I'm sure you, you might know, one of the, the artists um, that founded the school of the absurd. And I say this because I think talking about energy poverty is a little bit absurd, and I will explain why. This, this one? Okay, there you go. I think it is absurd to talk about energy poverty because we, need, we live in a world where we are capable of land a spaceship in a moving asteroid because we're in a world where we can write a whole poem just by typing a few words on chat GPT, where we live in a world where we can codify our history just with a couple of chemical test, and we have not been able to solve 750 million living in energy poverty. And to me, that's, that's quite shocking. We talk about, about 100 countries that today, they still lack access to electricity. I myself, I'm from Mexico. Uh, I know my region, we have problems of energy access and poverty. And when we hear the story of energy poverty, we always come with the idea of darkness and, and students using light bulbs to, 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 to get the, the readings. I am pretty shocked that here in Europe, there's 9% of people also in energy poverty, in energy deprivation. So when we talk about winter, 9% of the people have problems to warm their, their homes. And now there's another very appealing issue, and with the context of rising temperatures, the context of uh, global warming, and having a cooling in your home is also becoming a priority. And because various reasons, only 20% of Europeans have access to energy, uh, to air conditioning. And most of that is related because of their fear of energy prices. So to me, it is quite important to recall a phrase that UNESCO said once, and it is not the answer what enlightened us, but the question. And the question that I have to pose today to you is why we still have energy poverty. I think one of the main problems with energy poverty is that yet today, we still do not fully understand what it is energy poverty. Traditionally speaking, we attribute energy poverty to a problem of distribution a problem that relates to deprivation of household income, problems with the energy market, failures in the energy market, rising of prices, and problems with the efficiency characteristics of dwellings. And that's very true. Those are imminent consequences or origins of the um, energy poverty problem. But there are two other reasons that we must acknowledge. At first, we need to recognize the failure of the global socioeconomical system and recognize that we still have people in vulnerability and marginalization that are still impacted culturally, politically, economically, and socially by the dynamics of the energy poverty. And furthermore, we lack spaces for participation, for involvement, for engagement, and moreover, decision-making of many of these groups. So when we talk about this energy poverty issue, we're talking about a very integrated, holistic problem that is not rooted only on energy distributive uh, dynamics, but also in, in social and, and, and political dynamics. But today I don't want to come with a bad story. I want to talk about the benefits or the opportunities, better to say, to talk about energy poverty in the context of cities. And that's why I'm very excited today to talk about what the local cities can do about energy poverty. And it's very simple, to be honest. Cities and local governments have a proximity to the problem. They can really understand what are the magnifiers of the poverty. 
they can give a voice to the marginalized and vulnerable people that are experiencing these problems. And more importantly, with all the barriers, with all the shortcomings, they can engage with the city uh, stakeholders, with the communities, to create disruptive and innovative solutions to solve the problem. In other words, they can make the picture of the problem, create the solution collectively, and strategize, communicate, and persuade a shift of, par of paradigm in what is energy poverty and how it can be understood. Let me come back a little bit to, to, to Europe. Europe is doing a tremendous effort to deal with this. Um, and, and part of this exercise of solving the energy poverty crisis uh, comes to this, uh, uh, in my view, this uh, analytical uh, way of trying to define for all the members what it is energy poverty. So there has been a, a creation of this energy poverty index. On screen you see a graph of how energy poverty looks in different countries in, in Europe. So it, we can recognize that despite there are some countries doing better, some countries doing worse, we do have a problem. And what I find very interesting about this in energy index is how it is built. This energy index, is, uh, it has two very important things. The first one is that it does not only recognize energy poverty from the lack of access to energy services, but also the lack to, of access to energy for transport. And this is very fundamental because after the COVID crisis, we started also having problems for people being deprived to have access to, to an affordable way of transportation. Also very interesting in this energy, energy index is in the end, it's an index that is, again, reaffirming the distribution paradigm. It's based on the idea of problems to afford energy, based on the idea of the cost of household to uh, refurnish and, uh, and make more efficient their homes. It's based on the idea of the accessibility of citizens to, 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 to transport. And it's understandable, when we have this kind of indicators, that the extraordinary policies at the European level are being set, talk about measures to control inflation, support to renewable energy investments, programs to uh, create energy efficiency households, uh, uh, support to local governments to create programs that empower, for example, um, some stakeholders in the process of the energy transition. Despite all this, it is not to, 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 to be surprised that we're still talking about this distributive problem. We are still thinking that energy poverty is going to be solved somehow by changing the market rules, changing the way the economic energy system uh, uh, functions. And I think that it is not only the solution that we need to talk about. Let me bring to, to you this very interesting work that was uh, leaded by the global energy, uh, the covenant, uh, the covenant uh, of measures for energy and climate, together with the um, uh, subcommittee on energy poverty and energy access. This 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 study was conducted by Arab, and they interview more than 70 local governments across the world, including Eastern Europe, to try to unpack what is the problem of the solutions for energy poverty at local level. And at first, they, they recognize that there are barriers. We all know these barriers over the last days. We have been discussing about them. Uh, governments having lacking funding to do the projects. Governments sometimes lacking their resources from a human perspective, the capacities to involve into programs. And in some cases, even lack of leadership. But these are not only the issues that governments and local cities face. We can also talk about their limited influence they have on energy service and energy assets, and the limited powers to, to deal with the multiple views, multiple visions, multiple aspirations of the stakeholders of a community. So, so far, the story sounds quite terrifying, to be honest, but that's when the best part of this story comes. What are those solutions that can get us closer to a better definition of energy poverty and finding better solutions to it. And the first one is to amplify the horizons. The amplify the horizons of the policy interventions, when we think that normally local governments, they have an urgency to solve immediate problems, but many times they, they lack the, 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 the long-term vision. Well, by amplifying the spectrum of our aspirations, can help us define at local level what are better interventions in the short term. And we can create better methods to approach our communities and to distribute the resources that we need to create, for instance, cascading effects. 
It's very hard for local governments to have specialized people on energy poverty, but we need to find creative ways to incorporate the topic in a multidisciplinary approach. As for example, we do it when we approach climate and energy issues. So when we have an energy poverty perspective in climate, an energy poverty perspective in environmental development, an energy poverty perspective in uh, equity uh, of, of rights, etc., then we are getting closer to maximize the resources that we have and implement projects that generate benefits and co-benefits in various topics. Finally, another conclusion, and this is the one that I like uh, the most, and, and, and thanks, doctor, for intervention, uh, the collective power. How we can harness the collective power and strengthen our programs. And I believe that it is very fascinating that we think about tools, but if we provide the society with tools, we also need to provide the society with opportunities for them to use these tools, because if we give them the tools, they will not do the job by themselves. We need to create the space for them to actively participate in the decision making of the energy policies and the changes that we aspire at our local level. I'm going to finish soon with my presentation, but I want to bring to, 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 the, to this talk two, two things. The first one is that uh, dear cities and dear citizens, you're not alone in this endeavor, and there are institutions out there that are aiming to support you in this process. And I really want to bring this because the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, together with many other organizations like my sister organizations, C40, ECLEI, the Carbon Disclosure Project, UN Habitat, uh, the Joint Research Center for, uh, of Europe, and of course WWF, we have developed this, the, uh, what we call the, the pillar for energy access and poverty. And this pillar is now a new set of guidelines that governments can use based on 54 indicators to better track energy poverty with an integrated and holistic perspective of how this should be approached. And very interesting, this has been now ad adopted as part of the common reporting framework by the, by the, uh, created in 2019 by the Covenant, which is the set of procedures, the governance, uh, also guidelines that help us implement, design, plan, and monitor and track our climate action, always with a perspective of energy sustainability and resolution of energy poverty. So that's one thing that I would like to, to, to keep in mind, that now we have some procedures that can guide you to track better energy, energy poverty. And let me bring also one of the initiatives that WF has in place, that it is somehow based in these principles. We want to help you making the picture of the situation. We want to uh, uh, assist you in the creation of the co uh, co-collective knowledge and solutions, and more important, we want to assist you in the engagement process with your citizens. The One Planet City Challenge is the recognition that WWF does in more than 60 countries to those cities that are really at the forefront of the climate action, at the forefront of the environmental sustainability, and at the forefront of resolving the energy crisis. So I'm very happy to say that this year we're launching a project that is focusing on seven Romanian cities. Hopefully one of them is going to be Brasov. So here is my invitation to uh, the city of Brasov to, to join this endeavor of the One City, uh, the One Planet City Challenge and the Life as a Project, which is aiming to accelerate the climate action that happens at local level with the support of citizens. So I will finish my presentation uh, quoting something that I just recently uh, heard about from uh, Dr. Rachel, oof, I, I can't remember her, her last name. I will, you will need to excuse me. She's the Rachel Goyet. She's the director of CIV, the Institute for European Studies. And she brought to my attention uh, this fascinating element of the European pillar for social rights. And it is very clear, you're reading it. Energy should be seen as a human right somehow. It's something that should be accessible to everyone. And to finalize, I want to again quote Eugene Ionescu with this uh, statement. It is not the answer what enlightens, but the question. And my question is right now, when will we stop seeing energy as a commodity? And when we're going to start seeing it as a universal right for everyone? Thank you.